Welcome to the Wealth Builders Podcast, the women entrepreneurs' home for building successful businesses that generate passive income. You have entered a judgment-free zone. So give yourself permission to shake off all the things you haven't done because your journey to owning a thriving business you love starts right now. Welcome to the Wealth Builders Podcast, everybody. I am Renee Williams, your host, and I'm here today with my co-host, Camille Davis, and we're talking to Dixie Decker, the queen of student housing. She is going to tell us all about running student housing and running a business so that it's not a hobby. After a devastating divorce and bankruptcy, Dixie, a single mother of two, rebuilt her entire life through real estate. In the process, she accidentally stumbled upon a unique method for buying and profiting in real estate without actually owning the properties. That should be interesting. In just three years, she mastered the process, building her net worth to over $5 million and $100,000 per month in positive cash flow. Today, her cash flow machine runs practically on autopilot so she can focus on her family, growing investments, and helping others succeed. Her business runs on its own, so most importantly, she collects over 300 checks a month, and she has over 65 golden geese or properties with none of her own money in the deal. Dixie absolutely loves rehabbing and keeps anywhere from five to 10 projects going at a time. She's got Airbnbs, she loves teaching QuickBooks for investors, and she wants all of us to learn the ins and outs of running a real estate business. So today we're gonna have an awesome chat with Dixie Decker. Stay tuned, she's coming up right now. Welcome everybody to the show. Today we have with us Dixie Decker, and Dixie is going to tell us all about all of the fantastic things that she is doing in real estate investing and in student housing. Welcome to the show, Dixie. Hey, thanks for having me. Awesome. Thank you so much for being on. So you and Camille met each other. How can you guys tell us the story of how you met? Yeah, I'm going to let her tell the story because it's always fun to hear her tell it. (laughs) Oh, okay. Yeah. So we met at around the grand event back in 2014 and, um, she was she was adorable because she she started calling me the YouTube girl because I got learned how to get these deeds to properties and take them over subject to by all really watching YouTube and finding out how to do it myself. And um, but no, Dixie was brand new in all this. She had done a lot of rehabs though, like you were doing rehabs, right? Yeah, I had done a couple rehabs um, prior to that. Really, kind of what my dad thought was a rehab, you know, when I had credit and I had money and you got a realtor and you went to the bank and that's really all I knew. And I lost everything in 2010, 2011. And when you go bankrupt and divorced and single mom, you have nothing, you know, you can't do anything. You're just dead duck in the water. Right. And so in 2013, I met Ron Legrand and then in 2014, I went to um, his one of his big events and met met you there. Yes, and this was so amazing because she, in just a year, from 2013 to 2014, she was killing it. I mean, she had a staff, she had an office, she had gone and found a bunch of private money. Um, you, I don't know, you just had this drive behind you, and I think, like you said, you had you'd lost everything. Your credit was yeah. crashed because your, your ex-husband had crashed your credit, yeah. used cards that you didn't even know he used and yep. maxed them out. <laughs> yeah. So yep. Just came $150,000, $150,000 in yeah. credit card debt with my past beautiful credit score that I didn't know about. Yes. Oh. So hey. devastation. And she turned around, she took this moment in her life. And I think this is what makes successful people successful is you take those bad moments and you take and you and you change it and you you that fuels that fuels this like determination and this drive to just keep going but that's the yeah. hardest time that's that's when it's the worst so and i was just intrigued i was like we just had this connection because we were both kind of new at this and um, and women too, and women in the industry. Yeah, were y'all yeah. the only ladies in the room? Like, were you the only two, or not the only women, but were you two of only a few women that were with Ron, Ron Legrand at the time? I, 
hardly remember, but honestly, I feel like from the fruition of this industry, we are always grossly outnumbered by the men. Yeah. So I would have to default and say like, yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah. That's why I'm asking because you, you, I know with me, with real estate investing, I always find that I'm one of the only women in the room and strangely yeah. one of the only women of color um, in the room. And yeah. so the numbers get really, really small when it comes yeah. to real yeah. estate investing in women. So Dixie, you've done some phenomenal things in your career, just kind of since that, I guess, 2013, 2014, you've really taken off. So can you tell us a little bit about what you're doing? Yeah. Um, so I learned from Ron. And again, like prior to 2013, I didn't even know what the word wholesaling was. I didn't know lease option. I didn't know subject to, I didn't own, I didn't know owner financing. I didn't know private lending. I had no clue this world existed outside of traditional real estate. And so when you learn from Ron, the whole goal is to pick up a pretty house and then you're going to rent to own it to someone else. Mm -hmm. And we picked up a house on a lease option. It was near campus. And I say we, because my best friend and I were doing this together, Brandon, and uh, I now married him and we run the business, but uh, mostly I'm operations and created the system and all that stuff. He's really good at uh, working with planning and zoning and like engineering stuff. That's what he did in the military. So it's a great combination. But so we were at the, we, we picked up this house and um, put out ads for rent to own. Like Ron said, Ron told me to do it. I'm a straight A student. So I follow the rules and everyone would call and say, we don't want to give you a down payment. We just want to rent it. Our kid's going to go to college and we don't want to stay there for more than a year or two. So we just want to rent it. And I'm like, I'm not allowed to rent it. I have to get a down payment. This is rent to own only. And um, Brandon and I chatted about it. And he's like, you know, when I got out of the military, uh, a battle buddy and him like fixed up a house and they were going to rent it to college kids. And I was like, it's insane. Insanity to rent college kids. Like, can you even get homeowner's insurance on them? Like they're going to destroy the house. This is craziness. And so he says, well, this is how much they'll pay per room. And I'm like, okay, well, Ron didn't say we could do that. And I said, I said, but he did say we could sublease it, that every agreement we write has the ability to be subleased. So that's a college kid is no different than anyone else. You're still subleasing, right? So I ran an ad and I priced the house basically by the room. But I also said, you have to fill the whole unit. So it's, it's, I think that one was like 400 or 450 a room. You must fill the whole unit. It's three bedrooms. Well, here they came. I was only going to get like 850 total from a single family rental plus then a down payment. So I was like, okay, this works. So they wanted, they wanted the house. So we did it. And then we were like, let's do that again. We just kept going. So now we probably average between 550 and 575 per room and rent. We have over 300 college kids that live in our houses and they don't destroy the places. I, I created a model where I write one lease for one unit, three or four college kids are on that lease, three or four sets of parents are on that lease. I don't do any credit checks. I've never had an eviction for college kids and they pay rent 12 months out of the year. So I don't care if they're out of school May 15th. If I wrote a 12 month lease, they fulfill the whole thing. Uh, we're very upfront about that, that we don't, you know, just because you're out of college during the summer, we, you know, our business model says we have to write a 12 month lease. Um, if that doesn't work for you, that's totally okay. They're used to it. The really cool thing is, I don't know about you guys, but when I had my first child, I was like, how am I going to pay for college? Like I'm birthing them and I'm like, how am I going to pay for college? <laughs> and so parent, all the, all parents are that way, right? They're like, they're ready to pay for dorms. And so when the kid leaves the dorms, the parents have still budgeted to pay for housing. Yeah. And so who better for it to go to than someone like us that's providing super nice housing. I'm not a slumlord. I've got hardwood, granites, tile. Um, which is why I can charge a really good rate because I have nice housing. 
And so I fell in love with this niche. I, I love it better than single family rentals. Um, the parents come down and clean my houses so they can get all their security deposit back. Um, I can turn over a lot of properties in 24 hours because of the condition they leave them in. I'm telling you when my single family people leave, it's almost a mini rehab all over again, new carpet, sheetrock holes, painting. Um, it's not that way with my college kids because they, there's so much peer pressure and parents on the lease, they want their money back. And I'm happy to give it back. Like, and I love being that kind of landlord because I'll be like, hey, here's the deal. This is what we need you to do. And please help me because I don't want to keep your security deposit. Like, please help me give it all back to you. And I'm like, when's the last time a landlord said that to a tenant? They don't. Yeah. So I love positive reinforcement. And I I just I just fell in love with it. And the cash flow is superior to any other model I've experienced. That's amazing. So when you say, so when you rent it to a single family, uh, like just a, a regular family, so you, what is the difference? So if you, so you would get how much a month for the house if you rent, rent it to a regular family? So uh, like around here, so I'm in Springfield, Missouri. My campus is Missouri State University. Um, in this particular area, let's say a three or four bedroom house for single families would go from 800 to $1,200 a month top end. Okay. Um, I'm getting anywhere from 1500 to $2,400 for a three or four bedroom a month. Okay. So like double, pretty much yeah. double. That's yeah. awesome. Wow. That so is now, amazing. You, now you're the student housing queen. Yes. <laughs> That's what Ron named me, Queen of Student Housing. That's not a bad moniker to have. I think it's fantastic. And with 300 students um, that you're serving, did, did I get that number right? Is it 300? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. That is, you are the queen, Miss Dixie yeah. Decker. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. So just to unpack a little bit about what you were saying, Dixie, the way that your programming is working is that parents are the ones who are going on the lease. And then are, are the students also on the lease or is it just mom and dad? How are you managing that? So we always put the students on. They're our primaries because we want to hold them accountable and responsible. And they are who we communicate with primarily. Um, we add the parents as co-signers uh, and guarantors. So if anything goes sideways, for example, let's just pretend someone didn't pay their rent. And I've had this happen. I rarely have anyone that's late on rent because parents are usually the ones paying. However, one time we had a group paying rent and it was short rent. And we're like, okay. So we shoot a message to the roommates. Hey, looks like rent's not paid in full this month. Then they get to go harass the one that didn't pay, right? Yeah. And then we messaged the parents and said, hey, it appears rent's not paid in full for May. And Mama Bear is calling us. I gave him his rent money. I don't know what he did with it. That's it. He no longer gets it sent to him. I'm paying you direct. By the way, can I just pay you all 12 months up front? Sure can. Right? So... <laughs> That's, that's the beautiful thing is I, I operate off of peer pressure if needed. And then the parents, they don't want me ruining their credit if something goes sideways. And even if one parent decides they don't care, it's really unlikely that the other parents are going to be like, it's cool. You can sue us. Like they've worked really hard, most likely to be able to afford their lifestyles plus provide for their child. And so I kind of operate off of that opportunity that that's what we all want in the end, not to have to ruin anyone's credit. So I have a whole file that I can take to court if needed, but I've never upfront ran a credit check on any college rental I have. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah. I completely agree. And I love the system. I love the way that you have it set up um, so that, you know, the students are first, you know, responsible because I have a daughter who's in college right now, and we are literally in the process of looking for housing for the fall semester coming up. Um, yeah. And so, yeah. And so with that, she's the one I've, I've charged her with, you find the place, you get the application, 
Where do we need to co-sign? Like I'm making her be responsible for it. So that way it's not all on me. And I yeah. love that. And you know what I, you know what I love that you just said, and this is what makes it so real life is you said, where do we co-sign? You don't even question the fact that you're going to have to co-sign. No, it's automatic. So, they have no credit automatic. and no job. <laughs> yeah. So people ask me all the time, like, how do you get the parents to do this? And I'm like, so no I rarely have to explain why they are already programmed to want to co-sign. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Like right. you said it and didn't even know you said it really. And that's, that's just, you know, that's real life of what I have a college daughter as well. And I know when she goes out there, she ain't got no money. She ain't got no credit. Right. <laughs> Somebody's renting to her. <laughs> no. No. Then people say, people go, well, why, um, how come the neighbor that has the house next door isn't doing what you do? And I said, well, some of them do, but most of them don't because of that right there. They don't want to rent to a college kid yeah, because they don't understand it. And I don't need to be the one that teaches them. No. So that's why it works for me. That's, that's amazing. That's amazing. So now are you teaching then? Are you coaching? how to do this or what oh, is- that's like a super loaded. Question. Yeah. Right. <laughs> um, yeah. So yeah. So in 2016, Ron found out what I was doing here in Springfield because he came to town and I was, um, Nikki had reached out. He was speaking at Aria and she's like, Hey, I know you live there. Will you just pick him up from the airport? And I said, sure. So he got in my car and I was like, Hey, I've got you hostage in my car for a bit. Can I show you what I've been doing? And he's like, okay. So then he says, young lady, you're going to be on my stage and you're going to teach my people what you're doing. And I'm like, that's exactly what he does. He tells no. me what you're going to do. I did not do, I like skipped public speaking and avoided that at all costs. There's no way. He's like, yeah, you are. And I'm like, okay. Of course, if Ron says, Dixie, you're going to do this. I'm like, okay. Um, So that was 2016. So yes, I started teaching, training, and speaking. I started traveling and talking on stages and RIAs. And then I held my own live events here and taught taught students, student housing. I took them inside my property so they could see real life, how the college kids live. And then COVID hit. And I really made a lot of changes kind of kind of not really during COVID, but just post COVID kind of determined that I was not a fan of hitting the airplanes and packing a suitcase and leaving my children. And as much as I loved teaching, I didn't love that side of it. And so I, I pivoted and I loaded everything I have done to a digital platform teaching wise. And then I started teaching weekly live through that digital program So everyone that was scheduled to come to my live events, we started doing digital teachings and I saved and recorded all of that content and built a program digitally for people. Uh, So now that I held my last live event last year, and now I just need to make a decision. Do I want to teach again live? Am I only going to teach digitally? And depending on that answer, how do I accomplish that without traveling all over the world and leaving my kids? And everyone thinks that looks very glamorous to travel for work and see new cities. And I'm like, you don't understand. It's like pack a suitcase, hit a flight, get a layover. You're stressed. You might miss the meeting. You go to the meeting. You're mandated to sell so much. You go back to your room. You barely get any sleep. You're back on an airplane. Like it's not glorious. And so I just have to make some decisions. And that's kind of what, when we were chatting offline, um, I'm kind of looking for someone that wants to partner up to promote um, selling my program so that I can just teach it. Mm -hmm. And I also um, created a QuickBooks program for real estate investors, because I feel like that's something that's not talked about in all the years I've been in this um, business. No one talks about keeping track of things. I'm so um, and- intrigued with that because I did the same thing. I'm like, if we could have a one-stop software where yes. it knows all your rental stuff, because even QuickBooks for real estate investors is completely different 
than hundred percent. You can't find bookkeepers that know real estate investing. Cannot. And I went through several. So I now have my accountants and I, um, I feel like we've created a phenomenal setup for QuickBooks for real estate investors. And she has taken additional trainings and classes to understand us real estate investors that are doing lease options and subject twos and owner financing. And we've created a process, a system, a procedure for QuickBooks. And so we have the last six months, we've been building that out. And I used my mastermind group as my guinea pigs because they're really the ones that inspired this. They're like, that's the one thing we can't find anywhere. We need help with our books. And I'm like, then let's do it. So we started teaching it digitally and we recorded all that content. And so now I've built out a program for QuickBooks for real estate investors. And again, I don't want to travel and speak to sell it. So I'm looking for someone to kind of like partner up with to start selling it. And then I can teach it. Dixie, that's uh, amazing because awesome. I, I literally had everything online and I have too many companies. So then I had to ex- extract everything, put it into a desktop QuickBooks. I'm still trying to catch up. I just hired a girl like a year and a half ago. She she got the books to try to learn how to do this. Yeah, This has been a painful process and I have spent thousands of dollars. Me too. And and now she's she's completely overwhelmed still because she's still trying to catch up and I still have all my stuff going on and I still started two more companies. And so I and you don't stop. You don't stop no. buying or you don't stop no. moving other businesses ahead to fix your books. You're like, oh, no. that's we'll, we'll, we'll figure it out. You just keep making money. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And I've been in the same boat. And so so yeah, so I'm really hoping um I'm going to get that up and going because I think it's a huge asset that people will benefit from. So again, I have a real passion for teaching and helping people, but I just don't have a passion for selling or finding the people to teach. So I need someone to go find the people for me to teach. Yeah. And then I'll be... There are two opportunities here that you all just mentioned. And as we are growing our audience, this is a new podcast, but as we're growing our audience and people are listening, they're like, oh, you know, maybe I can help with that. Um, yeah. But the two opportunities would be one sounds like sales um, or just being kind of getting out there in front of people, not necessarily you're the face, but like a um, promoter. Yeah, to be a promoter. Absolutely. And then the second opportunity for some of us who are real estate um, investors, but we have analysis paralysis, but we would love a good QuickBooks program. Sounds like an, a winning opportunity to really grow a business just doing QuickBooks for real estate investors. If we can learn your program, Dixie. Yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 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 So I would, investors would hire like real estate knowledge, savvy bookkeepers any day, any day. Yes. Yeah. I absolutely completely agree with you. So two opportunities there. And we'll we'll find out how to reach you at the end if somebody wants to message yeah. you about that. Um, but my next question for you is about actually getting started um, with growing this kind of business. I know that you said that the impetus was really for you to kind of make a life for yourself after all of the things that happened, but you still could have said, I've got all these challenges. I'm not strong enough. I'm not smart enough. I can't, you know, I just can't do it. What made you push forward and pursue, you know, starting this business and and to keep it going as strongly as you have? Um, so I always say this is kind of like a loaded question because I don't know that I have an exact answer. And But I think this is the piece I frequently see missing in people that I've taught or worked with or mentored. For me, I was as low in the ground as you could go. So I worked a lot out of survival. And when you're in survival mode, you don't really hear the word no anymore. It's how can I do this? I have two daughters looking up to me. I'm their sole provider. I have to figure out a way to feed them and provide a life for them. So I was always in sports. I was very competitive. So when I found this system with Ron, I said, let's just do what he says. And I'm not going to take no for an answer. And I have nothing to lose. I'm already there. So that to me encompasses the word grit. You just have to have a lot of grit and go for it. 
And I feel like that's kind of what set me apart from a lot of people was a lot of people go to these programs and I'm not trying to be mean, but they have a day job. And that day job is just enough to make them comfortable, just enough to get them by. And there's no real pain or motivating factor to make something happen. It's like, well, I already worked my 40 hours. I'm pretty tired. Like, I don't really have time. Y'all, I was working 80, 100 hours a week to make this business take off. It was no 40-hour gig. And I had a day job, but it wasn't enough. And I would work weekends and nights. And on my lunch break from that job, I would go look at houses and come back to my day job. My kids rode in a car and they smelled the nastiest of nastiest houses. And um, there was no days off to get this started. And I knew I had to do that if I ever wanted more than where I was. There was no, there was no question about it. So when I'm teaching people and a lot of them are like, you know, I was at my day job. I didn't have time to make phone calls. I'm going to do that on Saturday. Well, then Saturday gets here and, oh, my kids had a ball game and I had to go to that ball game. And I understand it. I have kids too, right? I mean, there was a lot of nights I was up late and I was up early and that's just what I had to do to make it work. So for me, it's like not taking no for an answer. I was a good problem solver. So if there was a title that had an issue and you know, this like subject two is I'm like, this is how we can fix that. You know, let's take the deed that's going to clear that off for you. Or I talk to my title lady and I'd say, how can you help me get this done? Like, I know it's a no. I know that investor can't close it. How can you help me close it? What can we do? She's like, do this, this and that. I'm like, okay, I'm going to do it. And maybe I don't close it for four months, but I'm going to be helping the sellers out because nobody else can do this for them except me. And I just saw myself in a position to help other people. I'm not in the house buying business. I am here to help people. And as long as you have that as your motto, I think it makes a huge difference in your success. I love everything you just said. Love it. I think I just got chills like the whole way through. But, you know, my husband would say to me, he's like, you're obsessed. And I'm like, I think you kind of have to be. We kind of have to be obsessed. But it was because it was this drive and it was helping people, like you're saying, and the problem solving. For some reason, for me, if I can solve a problem, that is just so rewarding. And then to, and then, to, and then that thing of, I'm the only one that can help them at this point. When they're in foreclosure, they have maybe two weeks in Texas because they don't yep. get, we don't get a notice of default, which comes out six months before. So no one else can close that. Like it's yep. even a cash buyer cannot close that at a title company. So I can just, I literally step in and save these people. I did one on Monday. The foreclosure was Tuesday. This was just this week. And he had a buyer. And the buyer couldn't close it because there was an IRS lien that popped up. Well, the lien yep. died. So I'm going to just remove the IRS lien, but he didn't have time. So I said, you know what? I will take the deed. I will take the deed. I will get the IRS rent lien removed three months from now. Cause that's how long it takes, maybe four months. And I'm going to rent it out. And I saved his credit. He's like, my credit's going to be hit. Can you just save it? And you know, it's yep. just, it's so rewarding. It's amazing. But everyone else would have told you, no, you can't do that. There's an IRS lien. You can't do that. It's not possible. Why are you even trying? And and most people, even if they've been to the seminars and even if someone else has told them they can, they go, yeah, I know I can't. And it's over. Yeah. For me, I'm like, it's not over. I'm going for this. I'm figuring it out. And literally the bank told me on Monday, they said, well, we can't get this that fast. We can't get the reinstatement that fast. It's going to take two to five business days. So then I called the attorney's office and they're like, nope, we can't do this this fast. So I called the bank back and I got somebody else on the phone (laughs) and I said, we have the money. We need to pay this. How can I pay this? And that person then got me the information. So, you know, you just don't take no for an answer and you just, you just go with it. Get somebody else on the phone that's going to help you, you know? So Exactly. Absolutely. Oh man, you ladies are teaching today. <laughs> well, I think we bond. We bonded at Ron Legrand's. We bond. We like like we're like souls. You know, um, it's yeah. yeah. It's yeah, you, know, you meet a lot of people out there, and um, I don't. I don't really just friend everybody I meet. 
And even if I do, I don't really follow along necessarily. And I think we friended each other and I follow, I stalk her. I'm like, yeah, girl, look at your new photo, you know? And, and I love to see the houses she's putting out there and the progress that she's making. And so I think, I think that's, it is special because it's not just everybody you meet at a seminar, you start following, you know, how many hundreds of people have you met in programs and, and seminars, you know? And so I love it when I click with someone and I get to see their success. And I just think it's so fun. And I always feel so honored. I'm like, Dixie's like famous. <laughs> you are. So absolutely. That, I'm like, yeah. She's responding to me. Like, and I know she's busy. I know she's doing all this stuff with Ron LeGran. You know, Ron LeGran came to me and wanted me to do kind of the similar thing. But I had four kids and they were all really young. Like they were five and four and, you know, actually 2014, I probably had, they were actually probably more like six, five, four. Anyway, so, and I was like, you know what? I can't do that right now. I really wanted that opportunity because I knew Ron LeGrand would push me and I knew he would yeah. push me out there, but I knew it was in my life. It was in, in my life cards, right? At the time. Yeah. <laughs> so, I know. Yes. Yeah. So I loved it. I loved watching you. I loved watching you. There's always today. You can yes. start today. Yes. Yeah. And I, we are, we're starting this women's group. I am actually starting some coaching, which I never thought I wanted to do. Cause I don't, I'm not a teacher. I'm a doer. I go take action and then I don't put it down on paper and making the vid- videos and all that is just overwhelming. And so uncomfortable. Yes. And yeah. I owe that to Renee. Renee got me out there. She got me started on this podcast and she got me in front of people. Cause I, now I got to be in front of people. And that is so it's uncomfortable. It's not my comfort. It is. Zone. <laughs> it is. And you know, I was, I told Ron, my biggest thing was I was raised I was so few ways I was raised. You go to college, you get a job, you have like that all American dream and you keep a great credit score. That's like life goals, right? I pretty much failed all of them and then some. And then secondly, you don't talk about politics, religion, money, or sports. So when Ron put me on stage, I pretty much violated every single one of those two. And I'm like, I am hitting home runs here because it's not comfortable, right? And it just puts you out in front of people to use you as target practice. Yes. And um, I just, that's part of doing this is discussing those things. And so um, I think my dad uh, almost died when he realized I was out there talking about these things to people, you know? So (laughs) he's proud that I'm helping and teaching, but it's always like, you got to tell everybody everything. I'm like, yeah, dad, because I'm transparent. Like I'm never going to fool someone or like sugarcoat it. It just is what it is. (laughs) Yes, I completely agree. And I think to whom much is given, much is required. You ladies have done some phenomenal things in real estate investing. And even though you need to package what you're teaching, you know, in a way that's comfortable for you, it is so good just to sit under you and just listen to what you're teaching, what you're, what you're saying just like rolls off your tongue. Like you guys are such naturals, but for those of us who are not in subject to, or that side of real estate investing, I'm just like soaking it all in. Like, wow, I'm really learning something here. And it encourages me to feel like, okay, I've got muscles on my teeth and I can go out and do this too. So, yeah. yeah. And I, I bet you're both having that, that same effect. Um, Cammie, you got um, a text from a lady who went over to the courthouse with her baby in a stroller, just like you, <laughs> you yes. had your kids in the car the first time <laughs> when you filed your deed. She did yeah. the same thing just from listening to a podcast episode that we had done previously. Um, and she just got the, the strength and the courage to be able to do it. So you are both impacting women in ways that you will may you may never know, but you absolutely are. You absolutely yeah. are. And thank, thank you. you for that. Thank, thank you both. You. Thank yes. you. Yeah. So um before we go, I wanted to ask Dixie about contacting you. Is th- what's the best way to get you on social media or all the interwebs website? Where are you? So I, I do have a website, DixieDecker.com. It currently needs a full rehaul. Um, my husband says, uh, the content is all very relevant, but I have like lost 65 pounds and rehauled my personal life. So he says I should rehaul that website as well. And, um, I have a YouTube channel where there's tons of free content where I teach there. I did 
crash and take down my business social medias. So I only have my personal social medias out there now. Um, mostly because I told you like I'm in transition and I don't know what I want to do. So I kind of just left my teachings out there, but I didn't want to actively be promoting when I don't know, um, you know, what I'm going to do with this side of it. So yeah, so I'm out there, they can find me, um, pretty easily, but there's hundreds of minutes and hours, probably of free content on student housing, primarily on YouTube. And then, um, you know, if someone's interested in either of those programs, they're still available. Just shoot me a message, um, Dixie at DixieDecker.com, and I'll respond back. I, um, I don't have anyone that responds for me. It's just me. Uh, so I, and that's the thing, like I ran mastermind groups and I only took a certain amount of people because I wanted to, to do the work and spend the time with the people. And, um, when I questioned, uh, I, this was a little thing for me when I questioned sharing my story and I questioned, um, sharing on stage in front of hundreds of people, uh, my husband, which was, he's been my best friend since seventh grade, but, um, I got to marry him a couple years ago. Um, and I would say like, I'm really nervous. Like, I don't know. I don't know that I want to keep doing this. And he said, your one goal. And there, I said, why, why do I do this? You know, it's, it is so out of my comfort zone. And he said, your goal is to give one person hope yeah. or change one life in that room. Your goal is not to sell or make money. Your goal is to give somebody else hope. And I was like, okay, that's it. That's why we do this. That's the only reason we do this. Um, so yeah, so they can find me out there. And if I can help, I will. Hey, Dixie on YouTube, are you student housing queen or where, where do we find you on YouTube? I think it's just under Dixie Decker. Um, okay. It might be queen of student housing, but it's probably just Dixie Decker out there. Gotcha. Okay. Absolutely. For those of us who are, are internet users, we will find you, girl. Don't worry. Yeah. <laughs> Dixie well. at DixieDecker.com. That is super helpful. And Miss Camille Davis, thank you so much today. So I know that you've got some great coach, some great uh, coaching stuff rolling out for you too. And I want to make sure that we all know how to get in touch with you. So how do we do that, Cami, if we're interested oh, in coaching? Yes. And I, I need to get some business stuff going together too. But <laughs> The new name is Women's Wealth Collective, and it is right now, I want to change it, but right now it's Women's Wealth Collect Collective at gmail.com. And we do have a Facebook page, but it's new. We're just, we're brand new. And I'm, I'm exactly like Dixie. I feel the same way. I don't really want to be selling to the masses. I just went to a Dallas event with Teresa Todd. It, it was amazing. And I love everything that she's doing. But I also was like, you know, I don't want to be that person that's like, $20,000, sign up for my thing, you know, and, and cause I, it's that one person, it's that one person that I can change their life. And so it's, it's, this, it's a really hard place to be. Cause and oh, you want to know, you want to know the truth behind it. And this is my opinion. So people can come at me if they want, <laughs> we are really doing real estate. Yes. We have built businesses that are really working. And so teaching comes second. And often you will find the people that are grinding on the road 300 days a year are no longer actively doing real estate. You are exactly That's right. The difference. Their business now is selling and I don't want my business to be selling. I want my business to be. So it's, it's hard. It's hard to be in this. Like, do you teach and you spend all this time over here or do you do this over here and do real estate that you want? And, and when and if you go off the road, guess what stops coming in? Yeah. The money. money. Stops. Yeah. Guess what happens when I have my real estate business built and I go vacation for half a year. It's still here when I come back and it still produces money every single month because it's passive. So it's always the question of, do I want a passive income or an active income? Yeah. And I really like passive ladies. Do you want a job that you <laughs> keep doing or do you, even if you created the job for yourself or do you yep. have the passive income? Exactly. Yes. Yes. Well, on that note, ladies, I am going to say, I completely agree with all of that. Um, it takes uh, a certain kind of person to be able to do both. So there are doers and then there are teachers and very few people are able to build teams well enough so that they can do both, especially if their passion is in the doing. Yeah. So if your passion is in the doing, then keep doing. 
keep doing. Yeah. Put out there what you can. Let us, you know, grab along to your coattails where we can. We will find your videos. We will follow you. Um, and, and we'll be able to keep up that way. So whatever you have, we will soak it all up. But keep doing what you're doing and what makes you happy. That's right. Right. Well, thank you so much, Dixie, for your time. And we will see you thank soon. You. All right. Thanks, guys. That's all for this episode. Come back soon for more tools, resources, and great stories from successful women entrepreneurs. We believe you absolutely can build a business you love and have passive income. Until next time, thank you for listening. Here we go.